Yo guys, Unit 3. I'm running out of ideas for these intros already. Uh... This unit simply goes into more things to do with derivatives, and it is only 6 topics. For reference, Unit 1 was 16 topics, so if you can't tell, this is huge. This unit is worth 9 to 13% on the AB exam, and 4 to 7% on the BC exam. Um, I don't really know. Follow my Instagram. Let's go already. So instead of just jumping right into this video, let's instead start this video by analyzing this past video of mine. Now this video was actually made, edited, and produced in conjunction with all of these videos, all mostly in the same day. And so it caused all of these videos to not be as great of quality as they probably should have been. That being said, this video on composite functions made me say some, let's just say, interesting things. For starters, I taught this. Say you had a random function like f of x equals the square root of 1 plus x squared. Remember that you can break this down into two functions, and the original function would now become the result of two of h of x, so keep that in mind. And then I said this about the topic. This topic has gotta be an example of College Board just trying to pad their course and make it look beefy. So it's clear I obviously don't agree with this topic, but then I say this. Topic 2.7 is meant to essentially prepare you for the SAT. The reason I say this is because the only place you'll find the things in this topic is in the SAT. You see, the Max that made this video had no clue what derivatives and the chain rule was. He never thought composite functions might be an important part of calculus. So so I'll say it, I'll say it, College Board 1, Max 0. Anyway, enough about my past mistakes, let's talk about this chain rule. Just like this idea of a composite function being f of g of x, or h, or whatever dang letter, the chain rule uses that and says the derivative of a composite function, f of g of x, is equal to f prime of g of x times g prime of x. We are going to do a few examples of this because the chain rule is very important to know. Let's start with this one, x squared plus 7 to the 5th. Now if you didn't know anything thing about the chain rule, in the past, you would have had to multiply this all out, maybe even using Pascal's triangle, and then do the derivative of each singular term. Now with the chain rule, it is very easy. Let's start very simply and do the power rule. So we take the 5 down, we don't do anything to the inside function, then subtract the power of 5 by 1. Now to go along with our chain rule, all we do is multiply this by the derivative of our inside function. So the derivative of x squared plus 7 is 2x. Great! Now let's multiply this to get 10x, and this would be our derivative function of x squared plus 7 to the 5th. Now let's try this example, the derivative of cosine squared of 4x. Now, trig is weird, and I'm not actually sure why this even is, but saying cosine squared of 4x is the same as saying cosine of 4x squared. Trig functions just always have the squared before the x for some reason. But luckily, now that you know this, you can use the chain rule again. Once again, let's do the power rule while leaving the inside function alone, but then there is a function inside the inside function, meaning a chain inside of a chain. That just means we need to use the chain rule two times. So we first multiply it by the derivative of cosine, so negative sine, and we keep the inside function the same. Then we multiply it again by the derivative of 4x, which is 4, and multiplying the 4 times the 2, we get 8. So this is our final answer for the derivative. I guess you could put the negative sign out front if you really wanted to. Oh, and I guess you could also use the double angle identity to shrink it down even more, but stop making this more complex. This answer is good enough and will give you full points. You don't even need to know the double angle identities for the AP Calculus exam. I'll write one more example. Let's do a square root function. Let's say the square root of 5x plus 1. Ahem. Let's go over the traditional way of doing the derivative of a square root function. We first rewrite it to be the power of 1 half, as that is the same as the square root. Next, we use the power rule, and because of the negative exponent, we can rewrite it as a fraction. Ahem. Okay, now let's apply all of this to this function. But remember that we still have to keep the inside function the same, and then multiply by the derivative of the inside, which would be 5. So once we multiply, the answer becomes 5 over 2 times the square root of 5x plus 1. Okay, we'll call that good for the chain rule. I spent a while on it, but it is for good reason. Probably every single derivative function you get from here on in will use the chain rule, so make sure you know how to use it. And I probably should have said this a while ago, but the entire process of solving for a derivative is called differentiation. So with that logic, the chain rule would be differentiating composite functions. Now we are going to move on to something called implicit differentiation. So first, what even is an implicit equation? Simply put, it's just an equation where y isn't isolated on its own side. Instead of something like y equals x squared, which is explicit, you'll see things like x squared plus y squared equals 25, or xy plus 3y equals 7, where x's and y's are tangled together. So the question becomes, how do you take a derivative when y isn't already solved for? 
before. Here is the idea. When we differentiate implicitly, we treat y as a function of x. That means when we take the d dx of something like y squared, we don't just say 2y. We have to use the chain rule because y itself is a function of x. So the correct derivative of y squared isn't just 2y, it is 2y times the dy dx. So to put it in easy terms, let's use the function x squared plus y squared is equal to 25. To find the derivative function, once again we go term by term, so we get 2x, and then we get 2y, but because it is a y and not an x, it has to be multiplied by the dy dx, and 25 would just be 0. Good. Now to find the correct derivative function, we treat dy dx as a variable and solve for it. So subtract the 2x, divide by 2y, then cancel out the 2, and our derivative function becomes negative x over y. That would be the slope of the tangent lines, because there's more than one now, to the circle at x squared plus y squared equals 25. So really all you have to do for implicit differentiation is put a dy dx next to any derivatives of y functions, then solve for the dy dx to get the derivative function. Man, we are just speeding through all these topics. Next we're going to talk about inverse functions. Wait a minute, I actually taught this pretty dang well in a pre-calculus 2.8 video. So you know what, we're calling it. College Board 1, Max 1. Anyway, here's your notation for inverse functions if you remember. But what does an inverse function even mean? Essentially, it means the x and y swap places. So if a coordinate in the original function was at 2 comma 8, the inverse function would have a point at 8 comma 2 because the x and y swap places. That should all be review. Now let's talk about the derivative of an inverse function. It is 1 over f prime of that inverse function. And yes, you do need to memorize that. We're going to go over an example now. Take this table. Now say that a question asks us to find g prime of 3 when g of x is equal to f to the negative 1 of x. So as always, we start from the inside and go out. Since g of x is equal to f to the negative 1 of x, we can turn g prime of 3 into f to the negative 1 prime of 3. So now we have to look on the table where it equals 3. But not for x, for y. Because remember, x and y swap places for inverse functions. So the answer we get there is 2. So now we can plug that into our derivative formula, so 1 over f prime of 2. But we know f prime of 2 when x equals 2 is equal to 4, meaning the answer is 1 over 4. But what about this problem? If f of x equals 2x plus 1 and g is the inverse of x, what is the value of g prime of 18? So the first thing we need to do is rewrite this. Since g of x is really f to the negative 1 of x, we can rewrite g prime of 18 as f to the negative 1 prime of 18. So that means we need to first plug in 18 for the y value in the function, so for f of x. Then we simplify, and solving for x, we get 8.5. Now we plug it into the inverse derivative formula, and we get 1 over f prime of 8.5. However, since this is a linear function, the derivative will always be one number, and in this case, it is 2. So that means f prime of 18, or rather anything in this linear function, is 2. So our answer is 1 over 2. All right, let's move it along. What about inverse trig functions? First, always remember that this is notated in two ways. It could be your arc notation, or it could be the negative 1 notation you saw before. This is the part of the video where you unfortunately need to memorize six different formulas. However, it's really just memorizing three. Let me explain what I mean. We start with inverse sine, secant, and tangent. The derivative of inverse sine is 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared. The derivative of inverse secant is 1 over the absolute value of x times the square root of x squared minus 1. And finally, the derivative of inverse tangent is 1 over x squared plus 1. So now if we add the other three inverse functions, the derivatives of each are just the first three we went over with negative signs on them. And if you're like me the first time I saw this, you might notice that there are a lot of square roots in the denominators, which is what we used to call a big no-no in the world of trig. However, apparently in calculus, that whole rationalizing the denominator thing doesn't really matter anymore. All of these formulas you will need to memorize. You should probably pause the video as I'm speaking right now and do whatever you can to memorize them. But anyway, I'd be remiss if I didn't go over an example or two, so let's try this one. The derivative of inverse sine of 4x. So let's pop the formula for inverse sine on the screen. So let's plug everything into that formula, so 1 over the square root of 1 minus that 4x we had earlier squared, so it would just be 16x squared. But this is a function inside of another function because you have the inverse sine and you have the 4x. So we now need to do the chain rule and multiply it by the derivative of the inner function, which is 4. Then this is our final answer. And yes, you can put the 4 on top if you want to. I'll write one more. Let's try this example. The derivative of inverse secant of x cubed. Let's pop up the derivative formula for inverse secant. Once again, though, this is the chain rule because a function is inside another function. So we multiply it by the derivative of the inner function, and putting it in the numerator, we get 3x squared over 
over the absolute value of x cubed times the square root of x to the 6 minus 1. We could leave the answer as this, but the absolute value can be simplified with the numerator, so this would actually truly be our final answer. Notice how the absolute value stays and doesn't go away. That's because it's needed for the inverse secants domain. And really quickly, another thing about inverse trig functions. For reasons beyond human comprehension, inverse trig functions all possess restricted domains for which angles are allowed to exist. Now, if you're looking on the screen now and none of this is ringing any bells, I actually already made a very good short video on inverse trig functions that explains this very well. I will link that video in the description. By the way, College Board 1, Max 2, I win. Now let's move on to the last thing in this unit, higher order derivatives. Now here's the idea. Just like you can take the first derivative, you can also take the second derivative, third, fourth, and on and on. The notation looks like this. Anything after third prime would just be the nth derivative. The idea is pretty simple. To find a second derivative, you take the derivative of the first derivative. So the third derivative would be the derivative of the second, and so on. The only place this will get a little strange is with implicit differentiation. Going back to our implicit example from earlier, if we wanted to find the second derivative, we take the derivative of the first derivative, which was negative x over y. Oh, and god dang it, it's the gosh darn quotient rule. All right, fine, let's just put the dang quotient rule on the screen. Let's first label everything, then we plug everything in. Let's do some quick simplification. But now, here's where things get fun. We already know what y prime is because we found that earlier. So we substitute that into the function, and now, through a lot of very complex algebra, we can simplify it all the way down to negative 25 over y to the third as our second derivative. Not gonna lie, probably not the greatest example I've ever used, but it got the job done. And if you're not understanding the purpose behind this example, essentially the big deal with taking the second derivative of any implicit equation is that you will always substitute the dy dx you got earlier to be able to find the second derivative. But more broadly, if you're wondering why we solve for the second, third, and so on derivatives, here's my answer. I actually don't know. I don't believe we are actually supposed to know yet. Remember, I'm learning this course alongside all of you, and I suspect we will all learn why we take second derivatives in the future. But until then, why don't we call it a day there? Unit 3 is officially over. However, my ritual contractually obligates me to tell you to watch this video and subscribe to this channel. Believe it or not, this script actually took three days to write. Unit 2 took two weeks to write, so I'm happy with this unit. Thanks for watching, and you should probably click on this end screen, it's getting a little awkward, bro.